Rhetoric of science is a body of scholarly literature exploring the notion that the practice of science is a rhetorical activity. It emerged following a number of similarly oriented disciplines during the late 20th century, including the disciplines of sociology of scientific knowledge, history of science, and philosophy of science, but it is practiced most fully by rhetoricians in departments of English, speech, and communication. Overview Rhetoric is best known as a discipline that studies the means and ends of persuasion. Science, meanwhile, is typically seen as the discovery and recording of knowledge about the natural world. A key contention of rhetoric of science is that the practice of science is, to varying degrees, persuasive. The study of science from this viewpoint variously examines modes of inquiry, logic, argumentation, the ethos of scientific practitioners, the structures of scientific publications, and the character of scientific discourse and debates. For instance, scientists must convince their community of scientists that their research is based on sound scientific method. From a rhetorical point of view, scientific method involves problem solution to poi, the materials of discourse that demonstrate observational and experimental competence, arrangement or order of discourse or method, and as a means of persuasion, offer explanatory and predictive power. Experimental competence is itself a persuasive topos. Rhetoric of science is a practice of suasion that is an outgrowth of some of the canons of rhetoric. Topic: History. Since 1970, rhetoric of science, as a field involving rhetoricians, flourished. This flourishing of scholarly activity contributed to a shift in the image of science that was taking place. A conservative approach to rhetoric of science involves treating texts as communications designed to persuade members of scientific communities. This approach concerns scientific claims that are already considered true as a result of the scientific process rather than the rhetorical process. A more radical approach, on the other hand, would treat these same texts as if the science held within them is also an object of rhetorical scrutiny. Among those in the conservative camp, who view science texts as vehicles of communication, are Charles Bazerman, John Angus Campbell, Greg Myers, Jean Dietz Moss, Lawrence J. Prelly, Carolyn Miller and Jean Fonstock. Bazerman's close readings of works by Newton and Compton as well as his analysis of the reading habits of physicists and others led to a greater understanding of the successes and failures of communication. For a depiction of the views of the more radical camp, see the section titled, Critique of Rhetoric of Science. The history of the rhetoric of science effectively begins with Thomas Kuhn's seminal work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 1962. He examines first normal science, that is, a practice which he saw as routine, patterned and accessible with a specific method of problem solving. Building on past knowledge, normal science advances by accretions in a knowledge base. Kuhn then contrasts normal science with revolutionary science groundbreaking science marked by a paradigm shift in thought. When Kuhn began to teach Harvard undergraduates historical texts such as Aristotle's writings on motion, he looked to case studies, and sought first to understand Aristotle in his own time, and then to locate his problems and solutions within a wider context of contemporary thought and actions. That is to say, Kuhn sought first to understand the traditions and established practices of science. In this instance, Michael Polanyi's influence on Kuhn becomes apparent, that is, his acknowledgement of the importance of inherited practices and rejection of absolute objectivity. Observing the changes in scientific thought and practices, Kuhn concluded that revolutionary changes happen through the defining notion of rhetoric, persuasion. The critical work of Herbert W. Simons, Are Scientists Readers in Disguise? In Rhetoric in Transition 1980, and subsequent works show that Kuhn's structure is fully rhetorical. The work of Thomas Kuhn was extended by Richard Rorty 1979, 1989, and this work was to prove fruitful in defining the means and ends of rhetoric in scientific discourse Jasinski, Intro, XVI. Rorty, who coined the phrase, rhetorical turn, was also interested in assessing periods of scientific stability and instability. Another component of the shift in science that took place in the past centers on the claim that there is no single scientific method, but rather a plurality of methods, approaches or styles. Paul Feyerabend in Against Method 1975 contends that science has found no method that turns ideologically contaminated ideas into true and useful theories. 
In other words, no special method exists that can guarantee the success of science 302. As evidenced in the early theory papers after Kuhn's seminal work, the idea that rhetoric is crucial to science came to the fore. Quarterly journals in speech and rhetoric saw a flourishing of discussion on topics such as inquiry, logic, argument fields, ethos of scientific practitioners, argumentation, scientific text, and the character of scientific discourse and debates. Philip Wander observed, for instance, the phenomenal penetration of science, public science in modern life. He labeled the obligation of rhetoricians to investigate science's discourse, the rhetoric of science, Harris, knowing, 164. As rhetoric of science began to flourish, discussion arose in a number of areas, including epistemic rhetoric and the discourses on the nature of semantics, knowledge, and truth. One example is the Robert L. Scott's work on viewing rhetoric as epistemic, 1967. By the 1990s, epistemic rhetoric was a point of contention in the writing of Dilip Gayankar see critique below. The early 1970s speech communication conference, Wingspread Conference, gave recognition to the fact that rhetoric, in its globalization multidisciplinary nature, has become a universal hermeneutic gross rhetorical 2 to 5. Much scholastic output evolved around the theory of interpretation hermeneutics, the knowledge-making and truth-seeking epistemic potential of rhetoric of science. Argument fields part of the Speech Communication Association and American Forensic Association program, in this domain the work of Toulmin on argument appeals is exemplary. In addition, Michael Mulke, Barry Barnes and David Bloor, as pioneers of the sociology of scientific knowledge, SSK movement, fostered a growing sociobiology debate. Others as Greg Myers expressed the benefits of a collaboration between rhetoricians and sociologists. Contributors to discussion pertaining to audience, the way arguments change as they move from the scientific community to the public, include John Line and Henry Howe. Scientific giants, the important works that investigate the suasive powers of exemplars in science include those of Alan Gross, Newton, Descartes, Argument Fields in Optics, John Angus Campbell, Darwin, and Michael Halloran, Watson and Crick. J. C. Maxwell introduced differentiable vector fields E and B to express Michael Faraday's findings about an electric field E and a magnetic field B. Thomas K. Simpson has described his rhetorical methods, first with a guided study, then a literary appreciation of A Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, 1873, and with a book attending to the mathematical rhetoric. Other major themes in rhetoric of science include the investigation of the accomplishments and suasive abilities of individuals ethos who have left a mark in their respective sciences, as well as an age old concern of rhetoric of science, public science policy. Science policy involves deliberative issues, and the first rhetorical study of science policy was made in 1953 by Richard M. Weaver. Among others, Helen Longino's work on public policy implications of low level radiation continues this tradition. The reconstitution of rhetorical theory around the lines of invention, inventio, argumentation, and stylistic adaptation is going on today. Simon Six. The key question today is whether training in rhetoric can in fact help scholars and investigators make intelligent choices between rival theories, methods or data collection, and incommensurate values Simons 14. Topic. Developments and trends Topic. Epistemic rhetoric Seeing science from the point of texts exhibiting epistemology based on prediction and control offers new comprehensive ways to see the function of rhetoric of science gross. The origin. 91-92. Epistemic rhetoric of science, in a broader context, confronts issues pertaining to truth, relativism, and knowledge. Rhetoric of science, as a branch of inquiry, does not look at scientific natural science texts as a transparent means of conveying knowledge, but rather it looks at these texts as exhibiting persuasive structures. Although the natural sciences and humanities differ in a fundamental way, the enterprise of science can be viewed hermeneutically as a stream of texts which exhibit an epistemology based on understanding gross. On the shoulders 21. Its task then is the rhetorical reconstruction of the means by which scientists convince themselves and others that their knowledge claims and assertions are an integral part of privileged activity of the community of thinkers with which they are allied gross. The Origin 91. In an article titled, 
on viewing rhetoric as epistemic. 1967, Robert L. Scott offers, that truth can arise only from cooperative critical inquiry. Harris. Knowing. 164, Scott's probe of the issues of belief, knowledge and argumentation substantiates that rhetoric is epistemic. This train of thought goes back to Gorges who noted that truth is a product of discourse, not a substance added to it Harris. Knowing. 164. Scientific discourse is built on accountability of empirical fact which is presented to a scientific community. Each form of communication is a type of genre that fosters human interaction and relations. An example is the emerging form of the experimental report Bazerman. Reporting. 171-176. The suite of genres to which the rhetoric of science comes to bear on health care and scientific communities is legion. Aristotle could never accept the unavailability of certain knowledge, although most now believe the contrary gross. On shoulders. 20. That is to say, Aristotle would have rejected the central concern of rhetoric of science, knowledge. Knowing itself generates the explanation of knowing, and this is the domain of the theory of knowledge. The knowledge of knowledge compels an attitude of vigilance against the temptation of certainty Maturana 239-245. The claim of the epistemic problematic of rhetoric of science concerns Truth, property of statements with respect to other statements Knowledge, configuration of mutually supporting true statements Arguments, are situational first principle of rhetoric Harris. Knowing. 180-181 Topic. Argument fields By the 1980s, Stephen Toulmin's work on argument fields published in his book titled The Uses of Argument 1958 came to prominence through rhetorical societies such as the Speech Communication Association which adopted a sociological view of science. Toulmin's main contribution is his notion of argument fields that saw a reinvention of the rhetorical concept to poi topics. Toulmin discusses at length the pattern of an argument, data and warrants to support a claim, and how they tend to vary across argument fields Toulmin 1417 to 1422. He delineated two concepts of argumentation, one which relied on universal field invariant appeals and strategies, and one which was field dependent, particular to disciplines, movements and the like. For Toulmin, audience is important because one speaks to a particular audience at a particular point in time, and thus an argument must be relevant to that audience. In this instance, Toulmin echoes Feyerabend, who in his preoccupation with suasive processes, makes clear the adaptive nature of persuasion. Toulmin's ideas pertaining to argument were a radical import to argumentation theory because, in part, he contributes a model, and because he contributes greatly to rhetoric and its subfield, rhetoric of science, by providing a model of analysis data, warrants to show that what is argued on a subject is in effect a structured arrangement of values that are purposive and lead to a certain line of thought. Toulmin showed in human understanding that the arguments that would support claims as different as the Copernican Revolution and the Ptolemaic Revolution would not require mediation. On the strength of argument, men of the 16th and 17th centuries converted to Copernican astronomy gross. The rhetoric. 214. Topic. Incommensurability. The rhetorical challenge today is to find discourse that crosses disciplines without sacrificing the specifics of each discipline. The aim is to render description of these disciplines intact, that is to say, the goal of finding language that would make various scientific fields commensurable. Bach 29. In contrast, incommensurability is a situation where two scientific programs are fundamentally at odds. Two important voices who applied incommensurability to historical and philosophical notions of science in the 1960s are Thomas Kuhn and Paul Feyerabend. Various strands grew out of this idea that bear on issues of communication and invention. These strands are explicated in Randy Allen Harris' four-part taxonomy that in turn foregrounds his viewpoint that Incommensurability is best understood not as a relation between systems, but as a matter of rhetorical invention and hermeneutics. Harris. Incommensurability. 1. Incommensurability of theory at times of radical theory change is at the heart of Thomas Samuel Kuhn's theory of paradigms Bazerman 1. 
Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions offers a vision of scientific change that involves persuasion, and thus he brought rhetoric to the heart of scientific studies. Kuhn's structure provides important accounts related to the concept representation, and the key conceptual changes that occur during a scientific revolution. Kuhn sought to determine ways of representing concepts and taxonomies by frames. Kuhn's work attempts to show that incommensurable paradigms can be rationally compared by revealing the compatibility of attribute lists of say a species outlined in a pre-Darwinian and a post-Darwinian milieu accounted for in two incommensurable taxonomies, and that this compatibility is the platform for rational comparison between rival taxonomies. With a view to comparing normal science to revolutionary science, Kuhn illustrates his theory of paradigms and theory of concepts within the history of electricity, chemistry and other disciplines. He gives attention to the revolutionary changes that came about as a result of the work of Copernicus, Newton, Einstein, Röntgen, and Lavoisier. Some scholars, like Thomas C. Walker, feel that Kuhn's theory on paradigms leads to knowledge that is gained in small, incremental, and almost unremarkable installments. Walker states that while normal science is narrow, rigid, esoteric, uncritical, and conservative, Kuhn considers it to be the most efficient way to ensure accumulation of knowledge." According to Walker, while, "...ignorance and intolerance toward other theoretical frameworks are regrettable features of Kuhn's normal science meaningful conversations can only occur within a single paradigm." Kuhn's work was influential for rhetoricians, sociologists, and historians and, in a more muted way, philosophers for the development of a rhetorical perspective. His view on perception, concept acquisition and language suggest, according to Paul Heuningen Huene's analysis of Kuhn's philosophy, a cognitive perspective. Ethos <laughs> 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 Scientists are not just persuaded by logos or argument. Innovative initiatives in science test scientific authority by invoking the authority of past results initial section of a scientific paper and the authority of procedure, which establish the scientist's credibility as an investigator gross starring 26-27. Examinations of the ethos of scientists individually and collectively spawn significant contributions in the field of rhetoric of science. Michael Halloran notes in the Birth of Molecular Biology", Rhetoric Review 3, 1984 an essay that is a rhetorical analysis of James D. Watson and Francis H. Crick's A Structure for Deoxyribose Nucleic Acid, that a large part of what constitutes a scientific paradigm is the ethos of its practitioners. This ethos is about an attitude and a way of attacking problems and propagating claims, in The Rhetorical Construction of Scientific Ethos. Lawrence Prelli provides a systematic analysis of ethos as a tool of scientific legitimation. Prelli's work examines the exchange of information in the court of public opinion. His work provides insight into the ways in which scientific argumentation is legitimized, and thus insight into public science policy. One of the domains of rhetoric is civic life. Rhetorical criticism of science offers much in the investigation of scientific matters that impinge directly upon public opinion and policy-making decisions. Topic: <inaudible> Rhetoric and language games. Rhetoric can also be defined as the strategic use of language. Each scientist tries to make those statements that, given the statements made by their colleagues, and the ones the former expects they will do in the future, e.g., accepting or rejecting the claims made by the former, maximize the chances of the former's attaining the goals he or she has. So, game theory can be applied to study the choice of the claims one scientist makes. Zamora Bonilla 2006 argues that, when rhetoric is understood this way, it can be discussed whether the way scientists interact, e.g. through certain scientific institutions like peer review, leads them to make their claims in an efficient or an inefficient way, i.e., whether the rhetorical games are more analogous to invisible hand processes, or to prisoner's dilemma games. If the former is the case, then we can assert that scientific conversation is organized in such a way that the strategic use of language by scientists leads them to reach cognitive progress, and if the opposite is the case, then this would be an argument to reform scientific institutions. Rhetorical figures in science Corresponding to distinct lines of reasoning, figures of speech are evident in scientific arguments. 
the same cognitive and verbal skills that are of service to one line of inquiry, political, economic or popular, are of service to science This implies that there is less of a division between science and the humanities than initially anticipated. Argumentatively useful figures of speech are found everywhere in scientific writing. Theodosius Dobzhansky in Genetics and the Origin of Species offers a means of reconciliation between Mendelian mutation and Darwinian natural selection. By remaining sensitive to the interests of naturalists and geneticists, Dobzhansky, through a subtle strategy of polysemy, allowed a peaceful solution to a battle between two scientific territories. His expressed aim was to review the genetic information bearing on the problem of organic diversity. The building blocks of Dobzhansky's interdisciplinary influence that saw much development in two scientific camps were the result of the compositional choices he made. He uses, for instance, prolepsis to make arguments that introduced his research findings, and he provided a metaphoric map as a means to guide his audience. One illustration of metaphor is his use of the term, adaptive landscapes. Seen metaphorically, this term is a way of representing how theorists in two different fields can unite. Another figure that is important as an aid to understanding and knowledge is antimetabol refutation by reversal. Antithesis also works toward a similar end. An example of antimetabol Antimetabol often appears in writing or visuals where the line of inquiry and experiment has been characterized by mirror image objects, or of complementarity, reversible or equilibrium processes. Louis Pasteur's revelation that many organic compounds come in left and right handed versions or isomers, as articulated at an 1883 lecture, illustrates the use of this figure. He argues in lecture that, Life is the germ and the germ is life, because all life contains unsymmetrical, asymmetrical processes. Von Stock 137 to 140. Topic. New materialist rhetoric of science A more recent trend in rhetorical studies involves participation in the broader new materialist movement in philosophy and science and technology studies. This emerging area of inquiry investigates the role of rhetoric and discourse as an integral part of the materialism of scientific practice. This approach considers how the methods of natural sciences came into being, and the particular role interaction among scientists and scientific institutions has to play. New materialist rhetoric of science of a feminist variety include those proponents see the progress of the natural sciences as having been purchased at a high cost, a cost that limits the scope and vision of science. Work in this area often draws on scholarship by Bruno Latour, Steve Woolgar, Anne-Marie Mole, and other new materialist scholars from science and technology studies. Work in new materialist rhetoric of science tends to be very critical of a perceived over-reliance on language in more conservative variants of rhetoric of science and has significantly criticized long-standing areas of inquiry such as incommensurability studies. Topic. Critique of rhetoric of science Topic. Globalization of rhetoric Renewed interest today in rhetoric of science is its positioning as a hermeneutic meta-discourse rather than a substantive discourse practice. Exegesis and hermeneutics are the tools around which the idea of scientific production has been forged. Criticism of rhetoric of science is mainly limited to discussions around the concept of hermeneutics, which can be seen as follows. Rhetorical hermeneutics is about a way of reading texts as rhetoric. Rhetoric is both a discipline and a perspective from which disciplines can be viewed. As a discipline, it has a hermeneutic task and generates knowledge. As a perspective, it has the task of generating new points of view. Gross rhetorical 111. Whether rhetorical theory can function as a general hermeneutic, a key to all texts, including scientific texts, is still today a point of interest to rhetoricians. Although natural sciences and humanities differ in fundamental ways, science as enterprise can be viewed hermeneutically as a suite of texts exhibiting a study of knowledge epistemology based on understanding gross on shoulders. 21. A recent critique about the rhetoric of science literature asks not if science is understood properly, but rather if rhetoric is understood properly. This dissension centers around the reading of scientific texts rhetorically, it is a quarrel about how rhetorical theory is seen as a global hermeneutic gross intro, rhetorical 1-13. Dilip Gayankar in The Idea of Rhetoric in the Rhetoric of Science, 
looks at how critics argue about rhetoric, and he unfolds the global ambitions of rhetorical theory as a general hermeneutic a master key to all texts, with the rhetoric of science as a perfect site of analysis, a hard and fast case. In his analysis of this case, Gayankar looks at rhetoric's essential character first in traditional sense Aristotelian and Ciceronian. Then he looked at the practice of rhetoric and the model of persuasive speech from the point of agency productive orientation or who controls the speech means of communication. The rhetorical tradition is one of practice, while the theory evinces practice and teaching gross intro rhetorical 6-11. Gayankar asserts that rhetoric seen as a tradition Aristotelian and Ciceronia, and from the point of view of interpretation not production or agency, rhetorical theory is thin. He argues that rhetoric appears as a thinly veiled language of criticism in such a way that it is applicable to almost any discourse. Gayankar believes that this type of globalization of rhetoric undermines rhetoric's self representation as a situated practical art, and in so doing, it runs counter to a humanist tradition. It runs counter to the interpretive function of a critical metadiscourse. If there is no more substance, no anchor, no reference to which rhetoric is attached, rhetoric itself is the substance, or the supplement, and thus becomes substantial, giving rise to the question how well rhetoric functions as interpretive discourse. Dilip Gayankar's provocations have successfully opened the way to a broad reaching discussion that led to the defense of rhetoric analyses of scientific discourse. Responses to Gayankar's provocations are many, of which two examples follow. When Gayankar asks if a theory grounded in practice can be translated into a theory of interpretation, Michael Leff in The Idea of Rhetoric as Interpretive Practice, a Humanist's Response to Gayankar, see his views as too extreme, treating as opposites two positions that are in dialectic tension rhetoric as production and rhetoric as interpretation, and separating interpretation from practice in order to establish a causal, rather than accidental, relationship between rhetoric and the globalization of rhetoric gross. Intro. Rhetorical 11. John Angus Campbell in Strategic Readings, Rhetoric, Intention, and Interpretation. Also found in rhetorical hermeneutics is a verification of Leff's analysis 113. He argues, however, against Gayankar's notion of invention and the mediation between producer or writer and the audience of a text 114. The differences between Campbell and Gayankar is one of theory, and not whether agency figures in criticism 115. Topic. New materialist rhetoric of science The new materialist approach to rhetoric of science has endorsed Goankar's criticisms of rhetoric of science more generally and seeks to overcome them through interdisciplinary engagement with science and technology studies. However, the new materialist approach, itself, has been subjected to significant criticism within the field, and identified as a radical variant. The question as to the adequacy of rhetoric in its encounter with scientific texts natural sciences is problematic on two fronts. The first concerns traditional rhetoric and its capacity as a tool to analyze scientific texts. Secondly, the answer to the question relies on an attack of the epistemological presuppositions of a classical rhetoric of science. For this reason, the radical critique is a call for the renewal of rhetorical theory. Topic. See also Contingency Demarcation problem Epistemology Falsifiability Rhetoric of health and medicine Topic. References Topic. Works cited Bach, Ken. Metaphor and Knowledge, The Challenges of Writing Science. Albany, The State University of New York Press, 2003. Bazerman, Charles and René Agustin de los Santos. Measuring incommensurability, are toxicology and ecotoxicology blind to what the other sees? 9 January 2006. 1. Bazerman, Charles. Reporting the experiment, the changing account of scientific doings in the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, 1665-1800. In Landmark Essays on Rhetoric of Science, Case Studies. Ed. Randy Allen Harris. Mawa, Hermagoras Press, 1997. Booth, Wayne C. The Rhetoric of Rhetoric, The Quest for Effective Communication. 
Malden, Blackwell Publishing, 2004. Campbell, John Angus, "'Scientific Discovery and Rhetorical Invention", in the rhetorical turn, Inventions and Persuasion in the Conduct of Inquiry. Ed. Herbert W. Simons. Chicago, The University of Chicago Press, 1990. Dawkins, Richard. The Selfish Gene. Oxford, Oxford Up, 1989. Fonstock, Jean. Rhetorical Figures in Science. New York, Oxford Up, 1999. Feyerabend, Paul. Against Method, Outline of an Anarchistic Theory of Knowledge. London, Verso, 1975. Gross, Alan G. On the Shoulders of Giants, 17th-Century Optics as an Argument Field", in Landmark Essays on Rhetoric of Science, Case Studies. Ed. Randy Allen Harris. Mawa, Hermagoras Press, 1997. Gross, Alan G., starring the text, The Place of Rhetoric in Science Studies. Carbondale, Southern Illinois UP, 2006. Gross, Alan G. The Origin of Species, Evolutionary Taxonomy as an Example of the Rhetoric of Science", in the rhetorical turn, Invention and Persuasion in the Conduct of Inquiry. Ed. Herbert W. Simons. Chicago, The University of Chicago Press, 1990. Gross A., and William M. Keith. E.D.'s. Introduction. Rhetorical Hermeneutics, Invention and Interpretation in the Age of Science. Albany, State University of New York Press, 1997. Harris, Randy Allen. Knowing, Rhetoric, Science. In Visions and Revisions, Continuity and Change in Rhetoric and Composition. Ed. James D. Williams. Carbondale, Southern Illinois UP, 2002. Jasinski, James. Introduction. Sourcebook on Rhetoric, Key Concepts in Contemporary Rhetorical Studies. Thousand Oaks, Sage Publications, 2001. Kuhn, Thomas S. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 3rd ed. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1996. Maturana, Humberto R., and Varela, Francisco J. The Tree of Knowledge, The Biological Roots of Human Understanding. Boston, Shambhala Publications, Inc., 1987. Toulmin, S. The Uses of Argument. In the Rhetorical Tradition, Readings from Classical Times to the Present, 2nd ed. E. Dees, Bizzle, Patricia and Bruce Herzberg. Boston, Bedford, 1990. Zamora Bonilla, J. Rhetoric, Induction, and the Free Speech Dilemma. Philosophy of Science, 73, 175-193, 2006. Topic. Further reading Bazerman, Charles. Shaping Written Knowledge, The Genre and Activity of the Experimental Article in Science. Madison, University of Wisconsin Press, 1988. 2. Online version. Reporting the Experiment, The Changing Account of Scientific Doings in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, 1665-1800. By Charles Bazerman in Landmark Essays on Rhetoric of Science is found in Chapter 3 of that text. Campbell, John Angus. Scientific Revolution and the Grammar of Culture, The Case of Darwin's Origin. Quarterly Journal of Speech 72, 1986, 351-376. doi 101080 Gayankar, Dilip Paramishwar. Rhetoric and its Double, Reflections on the Rhetorical Turn in the Human Sciences. In the Rhetorical Turn, Invention and Persuasion in the Conduct of Inquiry. Ed. Herbert W. Simons. Chicago, The University of Chicago Press, 1990. Halloran, S. Michael and Annette Norris Bradford. Figures of Speech in the Rhetoric of Science and Technology. Essays on Classical Rhetoric and Modern Discourse. Ed. Robert J. Connors et al. Carbondale, Southern Illinois University Press, 1984. Harris, Randy Allen. Ed. Rhetoric and Incommensurability. West Lafayette, Parlor Press, 2005. Latour, Bruno and Steve Woolgar. Laboratory Life, The Social Construction of Scientific Facts. Beverly Hills, Sage, 1979. Leff, Michael. 
the idea of rhetoric as interpretive practice, a humanist response to Gayankar. The Southern Communication Journal 58, 1993, 296 to 300. DOI 10.1080/10/417,949,309,372,910. Miller, Carolyn. Genre as social action. Quarterly Journal of Speech 70 to 151 minus 57. Doi 10.1080/00335638409383686. Schreier, Catherine F. Genre theory, healthcare discourse, and professional identity formation. Journal of Business and Technical Communication 19.3, 2005, 249 to 278. Scott R. L. On viewing rhetoric as epistemic. Central States Speech Journal 1967 18 9-16. DOI 10.1080/10 quadrillion 510 trillion 976 billion 709 million 362856. Simpson, Thomas K. Figures of Thought, A Literary Appreciation of Maxwell's Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, 2005, Green Lion Press, ISBN 1-888009-31-4 Stark, Ryan. Rhetoric, Science, and Magic in Seventeenth-Century England. Washington, D.C., The Catholic University of America Press, 2009. Waddell, Craig. The Role of Pathos in the Decision-Making Process, A Study in the Rhetoric of Science Policy. Quarterly Journal of Speech 76 1990, 381-400. doi, 10.1080, 00335639009383932 Wander, Philip C. and Dennis Jane. Prospects for A Rhetoric of Science. Social Epistemology 14.2.3 2000, 211-233, 30 December, 2005. 3 PDF file Zeman, John 2000. Real Science, What It Is, and What It Means. Cambridge, UK, Cambridge University Press. <laughs>